Hello and a warm welcome to the library's 20th annual All Staff Meeting. This year's All Staff, like everything else these past nine months, is not typical. Hopefully you all had a chance to connect in the Zoom coffee break and perhaps enjoyed a cup of tea, courtesy of the libraries. Cheers to you all. I want to extend a thank you to the All Staff team, especially Stephanie Guerrero, for orchestrating logistics and production across so many different elements as well as libraries assessment, libraries HR, communications, facilities, and admin services. Producing this meeting in a typical year is a lot of work, and this year posed an even greater challenge under COVID circumstances. It was a tremendous undertaking, and your contributions are very much appreciated. What a year! While the All Staff is typically focused on the last academic year, the current reality of our everyday lives, the challenges we are facing today in this moment are worth acknowledging. Managing work, caregiving, isolation, anxiety, and uncertainty. These are real issues everybody is facing right now. We are adapting and yet the shift in our work and personal lives remains a significant challenge. It has not been easy, but I want to applaud you for pulling together and supporting each other for showing empathy and grace when it is needed most. When I think about the past year, I can't help but simultaneously think about the future, how we will take what we are learning what, and what we continue to learn during these extremely challenging times and use it to create better ways of working and being. Today is about seeing our past in the context of our future, reflecting forward, not only to meet the needs of our users, but to meet the needs of each other as co-workers, as teams, as one library. The increased collaboration between staff and portfolios born from this time is something I believe will have a lasting and positive impact on the way we approach our work moving forward. One of the most important areas of that work will be our continued efforts to reimagine what equity, diversity, and inclusion mean for us as, as we come to terms with the global social justice reckoning and civil rights movement that asks us all to do better. This must be a sustained priority and all of us have a role to play. We'll be talking more about our progress in this area throughout the presentation. It's hard not to think about life in pre-COVID and post-COVID terms. Pre-COVID feels like a distant memory right now as the intensity of the past nine months looms large in our collective experience. Today you'll hear from colleagues across portfolios to highlight the many different ways we have adapted and risen to the challenge. In the midst of such tremendous upheaval and change, there is still much to celebrate. For our library, philanthropy has always made the difference at critical moments. This support allows us to respond, to be nimble and grow. The conclusion of the university's 10-year boundless campaign in June 2020 resulted in a total of $39 million for UW libraries. The campaign far exceeded our goal of 25 million or 158% of the original goal, the highest percentage by any unit across the university. Just wow. The campaign added 35 new endowments for a total currently of 112. Together, these endowments fuel new ideas, pilot projects, and allow us to respond to critical needs in real time. This increased funding also allowed us to extend scholarships for student employees from 10 to 32. One of the things that I find most interesting about this achievement is where most of these gifts come from. It is not from multi-million dollar corporate or institutional giving. The majority, about 96%, came from individual donors, 17,591 donors to be exact. And of those donors, 88% gave gifts of $500 or less. And 68% of these gifts came from non-alumni. This illustrates the incredible impact of the community support for our libraries. This is a testament to the dedicated effort of the library's advancement team, developing and nurturing relationships and connections over many years. A very special thanks and congratulations to Cheryl Stiefel and her team on this significant milestone. But this work is not done in a silo. I also want to thank all of the library staff, current and retired, who met with donors became donors themselves, and contributed in many ways across all three campuses. This was truly a team effort. 
The largest gift to the campaign was made in this fiscal year, $6 million from the Atsuhiko and Aina Goodwin Tadauchi Foundation, a gift worthy of renaming the East Asia Library. Fortunately, we were able to celebrate and announce the gift in person about a month before shutdown. This transformational gift will support programs, space, and operating enhancements to better serve users and protect our unique collections. Thank you to Zhizhi Shen and the entire TL team for their efforts to steward this incredible gift. Speaking of protecting collections, another high-impact philanthropic gift came this year from the Mellon Foundation through a $1 million grant to advance shared conservation services among the libraries, the Burke Museum, and the Henry Art Gallery. The five-year initiative has been delayed due to COVID restrictions, of course, but when work is able to commence, it will help to address the unmet conservation needs of photographs, prints, and works on paper across all three organizations. Congratulations to Stephanie Lamson and her team on building the partnerships and support to enable this critical work. Partnership is at the center of what we do every day with each other, with other departments, with students, and the community. The UW Library's high school internship program led by Ken Flynn and Elliot Stevens is a prime example. In its third iteration during the summer of 2019, 10 local high school students, up from sixth of a year before, gained valuable experience and skills developing media projects while learning about career opportunities in higher education. Working closely with the Seattle Public Library and the UW Dream Project, the program is an ex excellent example of how we can engage partners to achieve our mission beyond the boundaries of our campus, especially and intentionally with efforts to reach the marginalized communities. These are stories worth telling, and now we have a place to share our work more broadly with the implementation of the library's blog. If you haven't read it lately, I encourage you to look back at the post this year because they tell your story and highlight so many aspects of our work that are often not seen. It's really great to hear different voices across the libraries represented in these stories. For most users, the amount of work that goes into maintaining collections, subscriptions, and other resources is invisible and intangible, yet it is foundational to almost everything we do. This year's negotiations of big deal journal packages with Elsevier, Science Direct, Springer Nature, and SAGE represent a significant investment of time and resources. In January, we finalized a new three-year agreement with Elsevier, representing more than a year of strategic planning and collaboration with UW faculty. This work was led by the library's negotiating team, alternate access teams, and was spearheaded by Denise Pan. The process created new libraries' negotiation priorities, guiding principles, and a Class C resolution passed by the Faculty Senate. These efforts provided the institutional support required for successful negotiation to achieve greater market transparency while reducing the total cost by nearly $900,000. We know by the growing coalition of academic libraries who are working to dismantle the unsustainable models that these companies rely on that this work is far from over and through this new contract, UW Libraries has made significant changes to our approach that will have lasting impact on future contract negotiations. I have highlighted but a few of the major milestones from our pre-COVID timeline, although I know there are many, many more. As we know, a picture is worth a thousand words, so I'll let the images of the past year do the talking now through this video entitled, History in the Making,
Marty Bartman really put the Seattle sound on the map. Before I left my office, I remember thinking about how someone in public health had recently told my partner that it could be a year before places like colleges open up again. Oddly enough, I felt a sense of excitement. I really needed some downtime. I needed to regroup and to recharge. Our Zoom Brady Bunch boxes have actually brought us together. We had to kind of harness our strengths and our talents for the good and the well-being of each other. So there are many positive things that have come out of working from home. My mornings are much less stressful. I'm grateful to be here with my family, but it is difficult sometimes. In the spring especially, there were many days when I could only take things one hour at a time. The pandemic has made so many already obvious inequities, digital and otherwise, all the more explicit. My hope for the future is that we strive to right those inequities. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Experiences in a New World, Lessons Learned from Organizing Online Conferences. Uh, thank you for joining me. And I was going to say thank you for coming, but the times being what they are. Um, I'm grateful to the University of Washington Libraries and the University of Washington Press for making it possible for us to spend some time together today. Is there a relationship between copyright and data? Yeah, absolutely. So, so data as facts do not get copyright protections. However, uh, the organization of facts can have copyright protections. In terms of how consumers are spending their time and what they're thinking about, definitely they are wanting to stay in touch with their friends and their family. I know I can speak to that myself. My, my, pretty much my whole life is through Zoom right now. What is the purpose that libraries have filled and what is the purpose that libraries can continue to fill, especially as we move into a evolving digital age. And also in this current time frame that we're in where we're expected to social distance, where many institutions are closed, how do libraries remain relevant in a post COVID-19 world? And then thinking about libraries as a place for democratizing, for politicizing, for creating equity and access to resources. Our libraries are closed right now. But UW Libraries are still working for you, Huskies. Just like always, your library is here for you. Odegaard Undergraduate Library. The UW Bothell and Cascadia College Campus Library. Tateuchi East Asia Library. Special Collections. Zulo and Allen Libraries. UW Tacoma Library. We're all here to help. Just like always, we are all here to help. We can do this, Huskies! We got this, Huskies. We got this, Huskies. We got this, Huskies. We got this, Huskies. Or should I say dogs? And so it was. During the week of March 17th, all UW libraries officially closed their doors on all three campuses, and the marathon of remote work began. Later in this presentation, we will hear more about the many ways our teams adapted to, the meet, to meet the needs of online learning. However, when I think about those first few weeks and months, there is so much to reflect on in terms of our immediate response. 
First, I'd like to acknowledge the entire library facilities team led by Linda Ombre. You are the heart of our operations, keeping our people, our buildings, and our collections safe. And a special thanks to Brad Van Horn at our Seattle campus, who has been on site since day one, monitoring and responding to many emergent situations, including making homemade sanitizer when supply chains failed. And to all of our staff who helped to manage operations on site at Bothell, Tacoma, and the Health Sciences Libraries. Thank you for keeping the lights on and so much more. You are the library's first responders and we appreciate you. The coordination and speed at which our teams work to increase access to available resources such as streaming video and eBooks was really incredible. Moments like this underscore the import of having flexible funding from philanthropic sources. With $116,000 in reserve funds from endowments, and new funds from the library's COVID-19 Emergency Needs Fund, we were able to purchase these essential resources quickly. During these early days, we learned teleworking skills and became Zoom experts almost overnight, thanks to the ITSDS team and Bryna Lieberman's patience, guidance, and goodwill at every turn. Within a very short period of time, events, workshops, and consultations were pivoted effectively to online platforms. As you saw in the video, one of the first tests of remote events was this year's going public panel with social justice advocate Nikita Oliver. A huge success by any standard, virtual or live, with over 260 attendees. It has been a time for experimentation, listening, and constant iteration. One example of this was the way that the Heal Wall program within the Health Sciences Library adapted to create virtual practicums, enabling participants across the country continue their field work instead of canceling it. Slack and team channels expanded, facilitating our ability to troubleshoot issues in real time and provide critical connections and emotional support. Through these newly expanded ways of working, we were able to crowdsource ideas and input that were especially helpful in creating the library's caregiver guidance document. I am grateful to everyone who participated in these discussions and I am proud of the ongoing work our teams are doing to engage and move it forward. The formation of the Coming Back to Campus teams, the directors group, and the online learning and innovation team are example of cross-portfolio work born out of COVID that have real staying power in terms of modeling how we can collaborate more and better across teams. We'll be hearing a lot more about projects related to remote support for users later on in the presentation. And I think that work is truly inspiring when I think about collaboration and what we've accomplished this year. In the early days of COVID, our website had to become a triage point for centralized communication. We built new pages, instructional blogs, and a COVID research guide. Thank you, science librarians Maureen Nolan, Sally Pine, Diana Loudon, and others. Testing these channels over several months helped to inform a larger redesign of our homepage and other website resources that continue to influence and improve communication with our users. Thanks to Christine Tuato, web operations, PWOG, Alicia Deutschler, Nancy Hewling, Jackie Bellinger, and assessment, and all those who help us understand how user needs change and how our website and communications can be more responsive. Internally, our very robust portal for COVID in staff web exists thanks to Carolyn Ahmet and the library's internet operations group. Our monthly COVID town hall meetings continue to address concerns and questions with transparency but also provide space for the community. The town hall structure is something we plan to continue indefinitely based on the positive input and feedback thus far. And last, but certainly not least, curbside, no contact pickup. Kirsten Spillum, Tammy Ger Gerard, Hannah Wilson, and the entire Access Services team, I thank you and our users thank you. When we talk about developing new ways of working, developing the service model from the ground up in the middle of a pandemic, with limited staff and a host of logistical challenges, you prevailed in record time. I recently heard this quote from one of our users. I feel like a seal during feeding time at the zoo, waiting for the books to be brought out to the Skagit Lane entrance. Certainly these feelings of happy anticipation and satisfaction are not unique among our users, and the Herculean effect, efforts of access services as well as their willingness to safely keep service going is definitely worth celebrating. So hip, hip, hooray to you all. 
After nine months, I know the marathon we entered back in March seems more like one of those super marathons. Instead of 26.6 miles, it feels like an ultra marathon of 100 miles or more. But no matter how long the rest of the race goes on, we can look back at these first few painful miles and see how far we've come. This perspective will undoubtedly be our guide in the months and the miles ahead. In May, the killing of George Floyd sparked a national social justice reckoning and drive for change at all levels of our society. The university, the libraries, all three campuses and many individual units within the libraries responded with statements of solidarity, support and a commitment to anti-racist work. While this work is ongoing, in many cases through mechanisms like the library's equity, diversity and inclusion committee, Many new efforts have been driven organically by individual teams and staff taking the initiative and answering the call to do more. These actions collectively inform our work ahead and there is still much more to do. The examples shared today are not comprehensive, but they illustrate how this work is showing up in our work today, all of which inform future planning and a change on a broader scale. In the wake of George, George Floyd's murder and the subsequent protests across our community, the need for more internal reflection and discussion was evident. The library's EDI committee organized discussion sessions for all staff during this critical moment in time. Since its launch in June, over 180 libraries employees have become members of the anti-racism Slack channel, which serves as a place to create community around organizing conversations, furthering projects, and sharing resources focused on anti-racism and diversity, equity, and inclusion. The UW Bothell Cascadia College Library social justice team and community reads teams built upon a long history of creating space for reflection within staff, adding more anti-racism learning sessions, hosting five sessions over the summer with more planned for fall and beyond. All resources and discussion guides are posted publicly for others to use, and I encourage you to take a look at them. Other teams are also creating space for ongoing reflection, education, and discussion in routine meetings, including special collections, health sciences, the library's cabinet, research and learning services, and others. Over the summer, the EDI committee made significant changes to its planning priorities, developing new strategic actions, and working groups open to all. Throughout 2020 and 2021, the committee along with these working groups comprised of library staff from all levels will focus on recruitment and retention, training, policy review, and a review of the EDI committee itself. I'm excited to see the recommendations from the committee and working groups as this work has the potential for significant impact moving forward. In July, the ALUW proposed to me and to the library's cabinet the formation of a tri-campus working group to reevaluate police presence in the libraries. In the coming months, the Decriminalization Working Group will, ad, will develop its charge to review existing policies and procedures relating to the use of police within the libraries. They will collaborate with stakeholders across units, build consensus, and form recommendations for change with a goal to eliminate or at least minimize police presence in library spaces. They will work to provide library staff with the resources and the support necessary to effectively and safely perform their duties and intentionally connect the library's work to other tri-campus initiatives on alternative policing. The group plans to make recommendations to the cabinet in December 2020. The Orbis Cascade Alliance Cataloging Standing Group, chaired by Aaron Grant, wrote a recommendation to change the subject heading illegal aliens to un undocumented immigrants, along with other related subject heading changes in Alliance search interfaces. The recommendation was approved unanimously by the Alliance Council in September, and the Norm Rule Standing Group, chaired by Jun Hee Lee, is currently working on a way to implement these changes. The Library's Racial Justice Resource Guide was created through the collective efforts of many, spearheaded by Teresa Mudrock and graduate students Bethany Barlman and Chelsea Riddle. There were many guides developed during this time, providing a starting point for personal education and learning and this guide collected important campus-specific information in addition to broader resources that many across the universities pointed to as a helpful tool. Well, these are a few examples of first steps post-shutdown. EDI remains central to the objectives embedded in the library's strategic plan. We see this work showing up in many ways through ongoing programs and initiatives.
Our library's reading and reflection groups across all three campuses are an excellent example of the important role we can play to encourage meaningful connections and to build community in partnership with our users, and in particular with marginalized populations. Through UW Bothell Community Reads, UW Tacoma's Real Lit, and Odegaard's Recommended Reads for Equity Collection, we create space to celebrate voices and perspectives that are too often underrepresented. Through the words of featured authors and all of the students and community members who participated with this this past year, both in person and remotely, we send a message to our community that the libraries is a place that is truly open to all. The library values the voices of community members who shine a light on injustice, racism, and inequity. The libraries is a place to find connection and support in a world that is, particularly now, isolating and disconnected from each other, others' lived experiences. These programs are not new, but they represent a commitment to our users a commitment to change, and a desire to learn as we shape our priorities moving forward. The Undergraduate Student Success and Assessment and Planning Team Partnership is an initiative that seeks to engage the libraries with essential student data to help inform our future work. It synthesizes UW and national data sources that assess the undergraduate experience with an em emphasis on BIPOC and underserved students. Through data-driven discussions and reports, the team seek to promote reflection and generate collaborative action across the libraries. Their most recent activity includes the report, Undergraduate Student Experiences During COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter. Again, I know what we talk about today is not comprehensive when it comes to identifying every action and effort being taken up across the libraries. It represents a few of the most immediate steps taken in the response to the Black Lives Matter movement early on. For now, I want to thank all of you who actively participate in this work, who ask the hard questions of leadership and of each other to push for change and for being open and willing to do the work ahead. This past year has been all about change and learning to adapt. The collective work of our teams in support of remote learning and research has been truly inspiring. But don't take my word for it. Coming up next is a chance to hear from our Spotlight speakers Mariah Caruso, Perry Yee, and Ann Lolly. Hi everyone, I'm Mariah Caruso. It is my honor to talk about the work across this organization to provide remote support for users to access resources in the past year. I'm gonna start by talking about the HathiTrust Emergency Temporary Access Service, or ETAS, as I'll say from now on. The Hathi Trust is a not-for-profit collaborative of academic and research libraries, preserving more than 17 million digitized books and serials. The UW Libraries has been a member of the Hathi Trust for over a decade, and our users have benefited from access to the millions of items digitized there to the extent allowable by copyright law, so where those items are in the public domain or otherwise not under copyright. Due to our membership, we've also deposited over a thousand of our own digitized books to the Hathi Trust. I'm primarily responsible for those deposits, so that's likely why they asked me to talk about this today. Prompted by the closure of libraries due to the pandemic, Hathi Trust ETAS became available to member organizations in early April. This service makes it possible for UW authenticated faculty, staff, and students to obtain lawful online access to end copyright digitized materials in the Hathi Trust when we also own the corresponding physical book. This awesome work on Hathi's part quickly created access to 1.3 million additional titles or 1.7 million books for UW users at the Hathi Trust, at least theoretically. However, making sure you, our users could find them was a whole other challenge. From the start, ETAS was intended to be both emergency and temporary, and our solutions to enabling search and retrieval of these additional resources needed to respond quickly. Clearly, cataloging 1.3 million resources as normal was not a realistic option to provide access to users in a timely manner. Our brilliant colleagues in CAMS and ARCS, including Nick Schnockmel, quickly came up with a way to embed NetID authentication information into the URLs provided by Hathi then matched to the correct resource record in Alma, thereby creating a clickable link going directly to the item in the Hathi Trust from our public catalog. And then do it again, 
over a million times, maintaining harmony in a complex consortial environment while pushing the boundaries of what our systems are capable of. We responded at lightning speed with innovative solutions. We prioritized getting users to an alternate and accessible form of a physical item as quickly and as easily as possible with no need to search another database or re-enter credentials. We were one of the first institutions to start providing title level access to ETAS items directly from our catalog, and we remain one of the few institutions providing any sort of coverage data, like volume or year, for ETAS journal title. Now, is it perfect? Of course not. Nothing is in a normal year, and especially not in 2020. But what we do know is that since being approved for ETAS on April 1st, our users have accessed an ETAS resource over 20,000 times. That's on average more than 110 times per day. And as you can see on this graph, after we completed the catalog work, that's never, we've never below 50 times per day, even on holidays and weekends. More than 30% of the time, that person used the resource they found for more than an hour, meaning it was useful enough to renew beyond the initial one hour loan. Our tri-campus community of users require a staggering breadth and depth of subject matter. They access books on the history of Asia most often with the languages and literature of Eastern Asia, Africa, and Oceania not far behind. I appreciate in seeing history, math, religion, and fine arts all in the top 10. Making sure that users have access to as many resources as possible while our physical doors are closed has inspired work across the organization this year, and ETAS is only one example among many. I wish I had more to time to talk about how circulation staff remain constant in their dedication to meet user needs by extending due dates and changing circulation notices repeatedly, how acquisition staff adjusted approval plans to prefer DRM-free online resources and increased purchases of streaming media, and how our organization as a whole, by too many people to name, reviewed and improved the accessibility of our web resources, databases, and unique audiovisual content. I'd love to talk more about tri-campus work by Lauren Ray, Denise Hatwig, and Marissa Petrich, championing, championing the creation of open educational resources on the Pressbooks platform which now has over 400 users and 11 featured titles, including Persistence is Resistance, celebrating 50 years of gender, women, and sexuality studies by UW professor Julie Shane and faculty and student con contributors from 22 institutions. Above all, this work demonstrates our dedication to our mission, our interconnectedness inside the organization and to the larger community, our capacity to innovate, and honestly, the ability to roll with it and figure it out in challenging times, striving to do our collective best for our users and each other. Thanks for listening. Aloha, my name is Perry Yee and I use he, him pronouns. I am the Senior Online Learning Support Manager with the Library's Instructional Design Team or LibID. And today I wanted to shine a spotlight on all of the amazing work the libraries have done in the areas of remote support for instruction, student success and research. With many of our events moving online, we've seen a record number of participants engage with libraries programming. We've set record attendance for online events such as electronic theses and dissertation sessions as well as online workshops, such as the Graduate Student Research Institute. Traditionally, in-person events also went entirely online. The Hacking the Academy program series, the Going Public Conference, the GIS Symposium, UW Bothell's Community Reads program, the Staff Reads and Real Lit series at UW Tacoma, and the Tri-Campus Digital Scholarship Summer Immersion program are all notable and highly successful examples of this transition to support our users online. And in a time of transitions where users needed remote support and online connection, the libraries delivered for our UW Ohana or our family. Even our existing online services like the virtual chat reference service was faced with their own type of transition. In 2020, we said ahui ho or goodbye and until we meet again to our friend for many years. Yes, I'm talking about question point. And in its place, we said ekomomai or come in, welcome to a new friend, Live Answers. And one of our favorite people here in the library is Alyssa Deutschler, the online reference librarian, was our fearless leader for this change as she supported library staff during the transition 
training and implementation. And thank goodness she did because the library saw online reference traffic increase by 37% between the months of March and July when compared to the same period in 2019. And when you compare annual stats, numbers were up across the entire system, including at the Health Sciences Library, which saw a jump of 300% over the previous year. That is a lot of chatting. So thanks to all of you who contributed to our chat reference service by volunteering your time and energy in leading, monitoring, and responding to our users. In support of the libraries providing enhanced online teaching and learning services, the Online Learning and Innovation Department was established. This team, headed by Interim Director and my supervisor, Robin Chin-Romer, hi Robin, met with library staff in spring 2020 to identify student, faculty, and user needs. And as a result, OLNI, as we call them, developed an online and hybrid learning plan for the upcoming academic year, and has helped the libraries transition to an online first, equity first mindset to support our users. The libraries were pivotal in lending support to our teaching colleagues and students who have struggled and continue to face challenges with the switch to all online resources. Updates were made to the UW Seattle Instructor Toolkit to support and promote open course resources and DIY instruction tools. UW Bothell developed the Online Learning Support Guide to assist students and faculty in connecting with online library services and resources. And the Tateuchi East Asia Library developed the Chinese Tea Hour in support of Chinese language teaching and learning efforts. And we also looked at new ways to collaborate and work with students. The libraries investigated participatory design methods by launching two student project groups, one with first generation students and another with students in completely online programs. Support for students also extended to other projects like the Undergraduate Researcher Tutorial, a self-paced introduction to libraries, resources, and services in various disciplines, and the recent Dog Days events like the Stay Quizzical Virtual Trivia Contest and the Huskies Go Scavenger Hunt as represented here by Bibliopup, who you see on screen. Research and clinical support for our communities were definitive needs during the pandemic. The new Health Sciences video repository was created within one month of shutdown by the HSL staff. This surgical and nursing video repository provides open access to hundreds of procedural and educational videos and will be a long-term resource, resource for the medical community. Its popularity proves that it will be a useful resource long after COVID. In Hawaiian culture, we have something called kuleana. Kuleana means responsibility, but it also means a privilege. And I think it perfectly captures how the libraries have approached remote support this year. It's our kuleana, our responsibility and our privilege to support our users. And with that, I hope you have a clear sense and understanding of just the absolutely tremendous quality and amount of work that has happened this year in support of instruction, student success and research. And it's because of our libraries, Ohana, or our family that we're able to do so. Now I say mahalo nui loa, or thank you very much for your time, and imua, moi moi aku imua, or forward, move forward with determination. Hi. My name is Anne Lally, and today I will be talking about some of the work the libraries has been doing in documenting and preserving history. The UW Libraries began archiving websites in 2013. Briefly, web archiving is the process of crawling a website to preserve both the content as well as the structure of that site. The UW Libraries contracts with the Internet Archive for this service. When the, dis when the societal disruption due to COVID became apparent, I was delighted we had a system already in place to archive the response to the pandemic across arts, culture, education, and research. We archived lockdown musical performances given online. We selected a cross section of K through 12 educational institutions to gather a sample of their responses. And we increased the number of neighborhood news which enabled us to archive the local response from an on-the-ground perspective. In addition, with the help of a records manager at UW Medicine, we crawled an additional 270 sites related to COVID research, research that was ongoing at the University of Washington. With the untimely death of George Floyd and the resulting protests, we began archiving additional sites documenting the local response, including the development of Chaz Chop and the resulting conversation. The library continues its tradition of collecting oral histories from the community. Uh, the UW Tacoma Oral History Founding Stories is a collection of 37 oral histories with the students 
faculty, staff, and community members who contributed to the development of the UW Tacoma campus. Taken together, these interviews create a narrative of how co community organizing and advocacy for a university in Tacoma transformed downtown Tacoma and contributed to advancing the branch campus model across the state of Washington. Connor Casey received Friends of the Libraries funding this year to document the experience of essential and frontline workers in the Pacific Northwest during, time, during the COVID pandemic. These oral history interviews include both union and non-union employees. Questions for these oral histories were developed in collaboration with organizations and occupational communities. Library staff Chris Kenzie and Annabelle Lerner took to the streets photographing the murals painted on boarded up storefronts. There are over 200 images of murals and other art and signage captured and preserved, which documents the ghost town-like atmosphere of Seattle during spring 2020. Some of the other activities in the libraries this year, in April 2020, library staff, including undergraduate and graduate students, classified and professional staff, librarians and archivists participated in intensive podcasting for libraries workshop. The library's cabinet and human resources department approved this workshop to provide professional development and remote work for employees. Perry Yee, Elliot Stevens, Brian Shipley, Charlotte McGrew and Joan Hua all facilitated the workshops. 39 library staff across the three campuses participated in these workly, weekly workshops. Hannah Palin received a Council on Library and Information Resources Award to digitize 338 videotapes created by filmmakers and activists during the 1999 protests against the World Trade Orgs. World Trade Organization in Seattle, Washington. These videotapes from the Independent Media Center include a unique perspective into an historic moment that brought together grassroots activists, labor leaders, environmentalists, archivists, anarchists, and artists who made history and shaped social justice movements around the world. This is the library's third clear award in three years. UW Libraries Preservation Services continues to make great strides in preserving digital content created across the UW Libraries three campuses. In the last fiscal year, Preservation Services has preserved over 178 archival information packages for a total of 13 terabytes of data. The hard work of UW Library staff in all of these areas ensures that researchers will have access to the materials needed to make sense of these times now and into the future. Thanks to all of you for helping to preserve and document history. And now I'll pass this back to Betsy. Thank you, Mariah, Perry, and Anne. What an incredible overview of work across teams and portfolios. I am pleased to add to the long list of accomplishments a few notes about the UW Press. 2020 marked the centennial celebration of the UW Press imprint. To commemorate this milestone, the press debuted a new brand and logo this year, as well as a new website. But reaching 100 years was not the only significant achievement. They published 55 new books, and the press received 308 reviews and won six prestigious book awards from scholarly societies, including an American Book Award for John Okada, the life and rediscovered work of the author of No, No Boy. The press hosted 78 book events, 18 of them virtual, collaborating with a range of strategic partners that helped bring authors' stories to new audiences, including Elliott Bay Book Company, Hugo House, the Capitol Hill Historical Society, and the High Desert Museum in Bend, Oregon. Another fantastic collaboration this past year is the Open Access OA eBook Project, a partnership between the press and the libraries funded by the Allen Endowment. Now most of the books in the press's long-standing and award-winning studies on ethnic groups in China are openly available worldwide. 
In the past six months, these books have been used in 123 countries. Usage statistics show that they're used far more often than comparable paid access books. For example, the OA books on JSTOR and Muse have been used over 13 times as much as comparable paid access books in the last six months. As a first foray into open access publishing for the UW Press, this pilot provided an excellent test case on how OA can significantly expand the reach of the press's authors and research on a global scale. What's more, these books and all of the books that are created on the Manifold platform are more accessible now because of the significant contributions and leadership of Elliot Stevens and UW Accessible Technology, who identified accessibility issues early on in the pilot phase and worked in partnership with Manifold to improve the platform. Manifold is being used by dozens of institutions and it is a better, more accessible tool in part because of this partnership and Elliot's dedications. Bravo. And now for one of our longest standing all staff traditions and one of my favorites, the March of Time and staff acknowledgements. If we were in person, I would be asking you to stand and be acknowledged. Since we can't be together in person, please take some time to send your colleagues a congratulations message on Slack, Teams, or drop them an email. They all deserve it. Seeing the March of Time, I can't help but think about my own march, which started 28 years ago with the UW Libraries. With my impending retirement in June, I know I will have a lot of time to reflect on all the milestones, progress, and challenges over the years that have influenced where we are at this moment in time. We have spent most of today reflecting on the past year, and now it's time to look to the future. Well, the COVID situation presents many unknowns in terms of when we might return to normal operations. There are several events and activities that are certain to shape our path forward, a few of which I will highlight today. 
In the coming year, we will build on the individual efforts happening across the libraries and within the EDI committees and new working groups. The Cabinet is actively reviewing our existing commitments to identify additional specific actions we can take to make qualitative changes towards a more equitable, inclusive, diverse, and anti-racist organization. This work includes reviewing and dismantling policies, practices, and cultures that perpetuate inequities. The Online Learning and Innovation Team will continue to implement the current online and hybrid learning plan with special emphasis on practices for creative, sustainable, and equitable collaboration between staff. This team will also focus on new ways to build meaningful community online between people and the libraries, including both students and academic support partners. Over the course of the year, we will learn a lot from our newest initiatives that have recently come to fruition. The new UW Libraries undergraduate research tutorial is now available and will officially launch later this month. Led by the undergraduate student success team and many campus partners, these modularized asynchronous sessions will introduce students to UW Library resources and services across disciplines early on, helping to address a gap in introductory training for undergraduate research. This is a fantastic new resource, and I can't wait to see how we build on it in the future. The Open Scholarship Commons recently launched as a virtual space that brings together libraries' consultation services, workshops, and events on a range of topics. We look forward to working with faculty and students to share and publish their work openly, work with data, use digital tools, and navigate their rights. By bringing together expertise throughout the libraries into the OSC, we will be helping support the university's goals to expand the impact of research and knowledge and the public good. We will be building out the library's remote shelving facility at Sandpoint to house hundreds of thousands of volumes under good environmental controls. The budget has been approved to build out 30,000 square feet. UW Facilities is working with campus architecture and planning to complete a design model for the request for proposals. Once the design model is drafted, UW Facilities and CAP will be meeting with the library's working group to answer questions and narrow down a timeline for construction and move-in. The library's working group can look forward to meeting with facilities and CAP mid-November. We will continue to monitor and plan for any additional university budget reductions and impact on the libraries. The fall enrollment numbers were solid and the state revenue forecasts are better than anticipated but we remain in a waiting game. Due to our success in diversifying sources of funding and building on endowments, we have the ability to cover most of the pre-COVID shortfall and the 4.6% budget cut to the libraries by using one-time endowment and carry forward funds this fiscal year. In anticipation of a flat or decreased budget for next fiscal year, we are planning for a subscription review for spring 2021. An unintended consequence of the pandemic is that the Hathi Trust Emergency Temporary Access Service, ETAS, has given us an opportunity to experiment with controlled digital lending, CDL. Based on a for fair use analysis, we are loaning digitized copies of print books in place of the physical item. We see CDL as a strategic action that will have impact for increasing access long after COVID and reopening. As remote work remains our modus operandi, we will continue to seek out best practices, guidelines, and methods for supporting all of us at home, be it reviewing and updating our caregiver guidance for employees and supervisors, ergonomic support and technical help, looking at new ways to build community and reduce isolation, and more. As always, please share your ideas and comments and suggestions through the Town Hall and the CBC input documents available on staff web. We will continue using our strategic plan to guide our efforts and decisions. It's our North Star. We, of course, are adjusting how the plan is realized during the pandemic and embracing the opportunities that this new environment requires. At this moment, November 2nd, 2020, the day I'm making this recording, I have no way of knowing what our world will be like come tomorrow, November 3rd, or the days and weeks that follow. But I do know that we, the UW Libraries, will continue to play an integral role, documenting these moments in time, gathering information, and supporting research to help our community understand and act on the issues that will shape our future. We will rise to the challenges ahead. We will move forward with integrity and commitment to fulfill our mission of connecting people with knowledge to advance discovery and enrich the quality of life.
everybody's life. It's been a history-making year. And now, please enjoy our final segment, the library's all-staff video. Thank you, and take care. <laughs>